Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today to uh, host this uh, awesome panel today. And uh, today we're going to have some dis discussion around the uh, value of data across uh, insurance uh, value chain. We felt it would give us the best access to the strongest possible group of senior insurance decision makers. InsureTech Insights is a must-do conference, I think, for the network that is built here. So um, I think the buzzword big data has been around probably for nearly 20 years, um, surprisingly. And uh, for as part of the insurance industry, um, we have actually come a long way of uh, cultivating the value of data. And uh, we've got uh, actually um, many great examples so far. So for example, um, from the pricing and uh, risk assessment perspective, uh, the pricing is no longer static and is becoming more and more dynamic. A lot of health and uh, live insurance companies are leveraging on uh, health data, on uh, wearable data to come up with more personalized uh, premium for individuals. And on the operational side, uh, underwriting and claims, uh, for example, paying on allow its customer to take a picture of their damaged car and submit as an auto claim immediately. And it actually counts more than 60% of uh, the total claims that th uh, they settled last year. So I think there's no doubt that um, data definitely has a value and very strong uh, disruption force uh, in uh, many parts of the, the insurance value chain. So uh, very happy to have three experts here today with me to uh, have a discussion around this topic. So um, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Wei Ju, founder and CEO at uh, Accident. Welcome, and we have a CJ Swamy, a CEO and a co-founder of Good Parents. And uh, lastly, we have a Jeff Kist, co-CEO from uh, Montu. Okay, so I think uh, to start off, maybe uh, we'll just uh, hear from you guys uh, an introduction about your business, yourself, and of course, um, part of the, which part of the value chain you feel you have the strongest disruption force by using the big data and data analytics? Hi, so uh, my name is Wei, Wei Zhu um, from Accident. So Accident, we are a uh, full stack insure tech player uh, based in Singapore, uh, but with a focus uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, so today we are building a variety of, uh, um, I would say, micro insurance products uh, that are targeting towards uh, digitally savvy consumers, um, their lifestyles. So we have a whole bunch of partnerships with uh, almost all of the top e-commerce players in Southeast Asia. Uh, we're getting to telco ecosystems uh, and also soon into the travel and health sector. Um, definitely very excited to be here. So I myself, I come from a um, sort of a heavy tech background, um, relatively new to insurance actually, so love to you know learn from really the veterans uh, like the audience, you know, uh, uh, people in the audience. Um, so I, you know, I, I have a, I have like 20 year experience in the tech industry. Uh, I was previously the uh, group CTO of Grab, which is the uh, probably the largest tech company in Southeast Asia. I was also one of the um, early uh, pioneers at Facebook. I was uh, um, architect uh, for Facebook platform. Um, so a whole bunch of things related to data. <laughs> yes, well, yes. Uh, it was an exciting time, um, so, and, and uh, Microsoft, etc. So very, very excited to be here and, and you know, uh, sharing experience with you guys. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rebecca, for having us here. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is CJ Swami. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Good Parents. Uh, Product Kiddo uh, is an early intervention platform focused on the pediatric and juvenile healthcare and insurance side. Uh, we have a three-layer tech stack. So we have a bottom layer, which is a wearable device that kids wear. We track uh, four key pediatric vitals, then kind of combine that with trend analytics to predict if the kid is okay or at risk of falling sick a couple of days in advance. If the kid is stressed during any point of the day, how much activity they're getting, if they're tired or fatigued. Basically providing health activity and emotional development analytics uh, to parents so they can understand what's happening with their kids. Uh, at the same time, link that with alerts and recommendations to mitigate these issues. And the third layer of the stack is a blockchain system through which we provide analytics to health insurers and for healthcare systems. So we work with health insurers to basically provide this pediatric data for pediatric healthcare policies, juvenile CI policies, 
enabling them to come up with flexi models around value-based care, uh, using our data for better pricing and for personalizing value-added services. And on the healthcare system side, basically integrating this on the record systems uh, for autistic kids, ADHD kids, uh, asthma, and type 1 diabetes, where they can basically use this for patient navigation and to essentially deliver care in a pretty cost-optimized manner. Uh, we're now actually in the process of setting up our own healthcare facilities in the US. We headquartered out of San Francisco. Uh, we're starting to set up our own urgent care facilities in the Bay Area. Uh, and ultimately, our ambition is to have our own pediatric insurance platform as well. Uh, personally, uh, uh, I was a serial entrepreneur, did two startups, sold a business to Foxconn. Then I was a VC for about eight years before I decided I want to go back to the brighter side of things and become an entrepreneur again. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Jeff Keast. I'm the co-CEO of Montu, a software company. Uh, so, slightly unusual background, I'm, I'm originally from New Zealand, but I've been living uh, outside of New Zealand for quite a long period of time. So I'm currently based uh, in New York, but I've spent a reasonable amount of my time uh, in a variety of places kind of throughout Europe, Middle East, uh, and Africa, and, and also North America. Uh, Montu is a, is a software as a service company. Uh, we predominantly provide our software into the life insurance market around the world. Um, Currently about 50 people. We've got operations uh, in Wellington in New Zealand, uh, in New York where I'm based. We also have a small office here in, in Hong Kong uh, and we're just about to open an office uh, in the UK. We have a fundamental belief that our, our customers in the life insurance industry in general is, is not understanding customer behaviour particularly well and, the, and therefore is missing out on a huge amount of value um, in their portfolio, either when trying to attract new business, manage existing customers, um, or even trying to convert customers as well. So our underlying belief is that uh, we believe in data-driven decision-making that helps insurance companies recognize economic value. So it's all about repeatable processes that understand the value in data and, cu and customer behavior and how you can use that on an ongoing basis. As a software, as a service company, with, I guess, all due respect to, I guess, some of our consulting friends and partners out here, we're not really about one and done. It's really about productionizing and weaponizing the use of actual data to understand real economic value. Um, for us at the moment, we're focusing on some, some primary use cases around optimization of pricing, uh, optimization of retention activities, around conversion, uh, and also around distribution behavior as well. And for us, it, it's primarily driven around where is it there's missing value in your book and the activities that you're doing, and what's the optimal set of decisions that you can make in order to improve economic value. OK, great. Uh, it sounds like we have a pretty diversified group and focusing on different parts of the value chain. And I, while you guys are talking, I already see a, a huge pile of data in front of me, <laughs> which is a good sign, right? So uh, I just want to ask, so um, throughout this journey, can you actually share um, some insights or experiences learning from the data analytics or any surprises um, that uh, come along um, on this journey? Maybe I'll start with Jeff. Sure, so um, I guess we've done uh, a, re a relatively high number of implementations now in a variety of different uh, countries. And one of the things that we've always found quite interesting when we're working with a new life insurance carrier is their um, beliefs or hypotheses around where value may lie and their, and their data doesn't necessarily hold true. And so if I think about some of the, the work we've done, uh, mainly around pricing optimization, so I, don't mind, I won't tell you the market or the customer, obviously. Um, we did work with a customer in a pretty large market, very large life insurance carrier, sold a huge amount of protection policies. Uh, they were playing what they referred to as the penny dance, which is basically you know, dropping their price by one cent or one penny um, against three of their other competition because they believed that being number one in the market was the best way for them to, to drive value. And so they had a, this hypothesis that number one was always best. It was best in terms of sales and also best in terms of optimizing uh, profitability or, or VNB as an example. One of the things that uh, our studies showed and, and that we are you know, putting into production for them that there's actually uh, no real economic value necessarily in being number one and also being number two. It was actually better to be number three if they were looking to optimize for profitability. And so a lot of their beliefs that they've been using for a long period of time showed that because of the way that they were pricing and the lack of understanding that they had in their data, they were actually missing out on pretty significant amounts of margin. And by moving their pricing slightly, they were able to recognize circa 10% improvement in VNB as a consequence of really being able to understand the dynamics of how customers responded um, to changes in their price, changes in their competitor's price, changes in underlying market conditions. And so 
you know, it's not really, you don't really attempt to go out and tell someone that they've been doing something fundamentally wrong. What you've got to do is, you know, show them a way that they can actually harness the use of data to provide a better economic outcome. And then the key from that is actually how do you put it into, into production. So it's really interesting. Like, so we've, we've got, I think, close to 15 customers now using our platform in a variety of different kind of countries around the world. I would say that, you know, when we, when we talk to them about um, understanding what their optimization objectives or goals are, uh, and we ask them about some of their beliefs or hypotheses around their underlying data and how customers behave and how they should be priced and how they should be ranked, quite often the data tells them something very different to what their beliefs actually are. I think that's a great story. Uh, uh, I, I just want to talk about, I, I think, two surprises that we had when we started thinking about this business. Uh, one was, you know, when we did research around parents would want to, you know, kind of get a platform like ours. Uh, I was surprised by the numbers which came, came out. You know, we ended up with a 74% purchase intent. Uh, among parents, uh, which I think is pretty unprecedented, even adjusting for tech adoption bias, which exists for kind of new innovative kind of products. And I think uh, the reason for that that we saw was actually twofold. One is there is this whole inherent uh, a need that parents have to keeping their kids healthy. At the same time, especially in markets like we think US, Singapore, Hong Kong, there's a big angle around cost of optimization as well. So we work with a very large healthcare system in the US, which also actually underwrites its own insurance. So they are both a payer and a provider as well. Uh, in that construct, we essentially saw that a lot of pediatric patients which were showing up on the primary care facility did not actually need to be in the primary care facility at all. So the percentages were almost like 87%. And like an example was uh, almost every kid who had viral fever was just showing up in primary care. But every pediatrician will tell you that in viral fever, they can't do anything. All they're going to say, okay, your kid has viral fever for two days please come back in five days. If the kid has fever after five days, we'll treat the kid. Because still five days, that's a generic, uh, you know, kind of path that the kid will kind of go through. Now, so because of this, the healthcare system was actually having to bear a lot of cost. You know, the, the, the physical cost of the facility, the doctor, the nurse, the fact that this patient was having to go and spend a couple of hours there. All of that stuff is not only being borne by the system, but also being borne by the peer as well. Right? So when we started working with them, what we started doing is one, we obviously focused on a lot of the educational aspect around the parents. So basically saying, okay, here is an issue. This is where we think your kid might be coming down with fever. Here are some things that you can do to mitigate this issue at home. So just getting a kid to sleep longer for a couple of days before they actually have fever changes the probability for fever quite dramatically. Right? Or just making sure that they don't play outdoors in the heat again changes that dramatically, right? There's a simple stuff that you can do. Now, at the same time, uh, if an issue happens, if you help the patient navigate that into a lower cost model, so basically diverting them into pediatric telehealth, rather than a physical visit, again, changes them from a $500 intervention to a $15 intervention, right? So that saves the system a lot of money, saves the payer a lot of money, but ultimately percolates down to the family because now they don't have to pay $4,000 in premiums, they may be paying $2,000 or $3,000, right? On the annual premium, sorry. <coughs> So I think that has been a big learning for me, right? So that when we started out, we thought that there was an angle here, but now we're actually seeing that, yes, there is a very significant kind of angle there. So, so for us, we are, you know, in, unlike, uh, unlike the other two gentlemen who are into the, in the health and other bigger ticket item um, products, we are working on the micro insurance part of the small ticket item stuff. So we get to, I mean, see, uh, some weird stuff as well. Um, like for example, we work with lots of e-commerce to provide uh, insurance for logistics. Uh, and those are typically very small ticket items. And uh, you see, you know, like for example, we, we found that dynamic pricing is actually quite interesting uh, because you know, a lot of the customers, uh, especially the, if it's like a shop that you're providing like return insurance for them, um, they, they do price comparisons, right? So like, so if we have a fixed price, that what, what ends up happening is that you very, very soon you have all, of the, all the guys who you know, do a lot of returns uh, and really abuse the system on, 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 on your insurance while they want to have good behaviors and whatnot. They feel it's not worth it and they drop out. Um, so because, you know, especially for the SMEs, right, they, they actually quite care about those things. So, so we, this is where we found, like, if we utilize our massive data and start to be able to do dynamic premiums on the transaction levels, that, I think, helps make this 
pricing more transparent, more fair to consumers. Um, and, and it does help. Like, for example, I, I remember like one time we, we, we did our like, you know, uh, machine learning, building our machine learning models for um, essentially the return behaviors uh, of products. And, um, and our system found that like, you know, the, the, the model found that if a product contains a description, um, Abidas, that, uh, that it's gonna have a high rate of returns and, and claims. Um, so, so initially we didn't understand why that is the case. But after you, know, you dig it further, you realize those actually are shoes, uh, product are shoes. And uh, if you think about it, Abidas, it sounds actually quite like Adidas. So turned out those are actually the knockoff shoes, right? the fake product. So <laughs> obviously they, do have, they tend to have a much higher return rate. Um, but if our, you know, I think utilize, you know, the big data, right? You do those kind of uh, analysis over, you know, tens of millions of data and, you know, hundreds and thousands, uh, you know, millions of product SKUs, it enables us to be, make the pricing more transparent and more fair. And I think that helps whole whole ecosystem. Um, yeah, and we do have some other interesting stuff with our, um, like, phone insurance, right? So we, this is where, um, we get, you know, utilize machine learnings and to be able to detect the condition of, of a phone before we actually issue a policy. And um, as it turned out, we, we first launched this in Singapore. And when we first launched in Singapore, it was actually, uh, it, was, it, was, it was good. You know, the things are pretty good. But then we launched this in Indonesia. And then we found that, well, okay, there's a lot higher rate of false claims and fraud. Um, so we'd have to really tighten up the filtering process um, and, and, and training the model so that it can be more strict. Um, but anyways, I, I mean, there's not a whole lot of you know, big surprises, but uh, lots of interesting small learnings. Um, very interesting sharing, actually. I guess uh, the lesson learned here is uh, before you can come up with any successful proposition, you have to really understand what the problem is, the pinpoints, and really understand the data. Um, so I, you, you guys sound like you've come a long way to <laughs> to this point. And uh, any uh, challenges you're, you're currently facing? Because I know from, uh, for example, data management perspective, you will have the data storing, data collecting, data updating, and all the op uh, on the operational side. But of course, from the customer perspective, as well as regulatory perspective, uh, data privacy will be one of the really hot topics. So can you please share with the audience some of the uh, challenges you're currently facing and any sort of uh, solution uh, you're actually looking forward, yeah. Uh, maybe. So you're talking about the challenge in terms of data privacy? Sure, yeah. I mean, you were, uh, I'll probably start off with you because you worked with uh, Facebook before, right? <laughs> I, I would almost want to <laughs> disclaim that. <laughs> but, but I would say, yeah, well, the, in some ways that, uh, you know, at a company like Facebook, the, the, the data privacy, privacy becomes a huge hot topic nowadays. So I guess learning for, for me uh, in that saga, I think, is that, uh, you know, we, we all have to be treating the, the customer data very carefully. Um, I think, you know, back when I, you know, first started building the Facebook platform in 2007, um, there weren't, like, we never thought that, you know, this could one day impact, you know, U.S. presidential elections or anything like that. It was all about, you know, kids and, and whatnot sharing, you know, uh, you know funny photos and, and things like that. Uh, so I think this is probably, like, true for many companies uh, over the journey of, of uh, utilizing data and, and data privacy. Um, we, I think we have to be very conscious of the potential impact it might have um, and, and really be adjusting uh, how you utilize it uh, uh, very dynamically. Um, I think we, when it comes to insurance, um, when it comes to insurance, I think, you know, we are careful in terms of starting on the areas where 
there's maybe not a whole lot of controversy, a lot of controversy. Like, for example, I mean, I feel like I have an easier time than probably the other two gentlemen because I'm not dealing with people's health data. Um, uh, I'm, I'm dealing with people's, like, phones, their, 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 their um, uh, how do I say, their, their e-commerce shopping habits. Um, that's, of course, uh, something that I think is easier for us to start with. And then we really have to take into consideration about having you know, the strict um, protections, how to really scrub you know, personally identifiable information uh, from different stages of a data pipe so that uh, you know, the, the information that are sensitive really gets stay out of the way of data analysis uh, at the earliest stage. Um, personally identifying information, people's phone numbers. Um, and then that's, I think, important when it comes to ensure and also working with regulators on how to protect your privacy at the uh, at early stage. Um, but I think uh, that's something that we still have a long way to go in terms of both educating the consumers, educating the, um, educating the what's it called, the, the, uh, the regulators and partners. Uh, in many ways, I think we have to recognize that when we, when we think about machine learning or AI, the thing is, the machine learning and AI, they're, they're, not, they're not actually smarter than human. Um, oftentimes what your machine learning model uh, come up with is a reflection of you know, stereotypes. Okay. And machines are not politically correct. Um, so those are things I think we have to add human interventions uh, and treat that uh, carefully. So CJ, the spotlight's on you now. <laughs> you yeah, deal so with a lot of health data. Correct, yeah. So I think just very quickly on data privacy, I don't think it's a challenge. I think it's a necessity in the business that we're in, right? So uh, ultimately, we are uh, holding not only just health data, but we're taking personal data, so identifiable data about, or about people. Uh, we are uh, also getting financial data about them. We're getting location data about them. So there's a lot more data just beyond health data that we, that we have. And so we have to be HIPAA compliant, we have to be COPA compliant, we have to make sure that the blockchain system that we've designed is fully encrypted, is fully secure, is auditable. So I think that's just the necessity of the business that you have to be in. If you don't check those boxes, you should not be in this business at all. Right? So I think that's my very simplistic view. I think from a challenge perspective, and forgive me if I'm being a little bit controversial here, I think the challenge I faced in some markets in Asia is that 50% uh, of the people here don't believe what they're saying. And what I mean by that is they pay a lot of lip service to the whole notion of data, right? So uh, every insurer believes that they are different to every other insurer, that's not true, everyone is exactly the same. Uh, every uh, uh, you know, senior person uh, in an insurance company uh, claims that yes, we use data, we do flexible pricing. Changing your pricing once a year is not flexible pricing, right? So, uh, uh, so I, I think, uh, it is if they were doing it every two years. Uh, yes, I guess of that. Right, right. So, <laughs> uh, so, so, so I think uh, you know we've seen significant innovation in insurance and healthcare in the U.S. Interestingly, when I talk to people in China, Indonesia, Malaysia, there's a lot more propensity for uh, for innovation. I have no idea why. Uh, right, because I would be surprised that it should be the other way around, right? In markets like Singapore and Hong Kong, which are a little bit more sophisticated, should be where innovation conversation should be happening, but it's interestingly in the other pockets. So uh, maybe that is because, you know, life and health insurance is growing here as, at 15%, uh, you know, insured rates are low enough, nobody really kind of cares, you are growing, status quo works, why rock the boat, right? So, uh, and the cost of basically doing something which might not work is, is not worth the effort, right? So maybe that's, that's the rationale here, but I'm surprised by some of the conversations that we have, right? Uh, I know we've had conversations, but I genuinely think that organizations like SCORE, which is trying to use data, looking at new product, kind of product development is in a bit of the minority. And uh, maybe it's a, it's, it's a symptom of the industry, but if there's significant concentration of insurers, then nothing ever gets done there. Right? So, uh, and that's, that's, I think, a challenge, kind of breaking that veil and seeing that, hey guys, you know, what you're thinking about is very short term. We're talking about something which is going to happen four years, five years down the line. This fundamentally changes your NPS, changes the way you think about VNB. Market is moving towards personalized, you know, kind of solutions, value-based care models, et cetera. There are, I think, some who really get it and really want to make an effort, 
and there are some who are like, <laughs> you know, I just don't see it. I don't see the need for me to kind of do it. So I think that is a is what I think is a bigger challenge because this is going to hit everyone, right? This is going to hit everyone sooner rather than later, and the ones who are not going to realize it are going to be uh, like, you know, what happened to U.S. companies where a Clover and an Oscar Health basically ate their cake. There are going to be new companies like, you know, his company or other companies who are going to come and just kill a lot of these insurance companies. Might not happen in the next five years, definitely is going to happen in the next ten years. Interesting. Um, I, I guess just uh, kind of one of CJ's uh, points around, I, I sometimes have a, well, I, I do have a belief that often emerging economies have a real opportunity to leapfrog some of the legacy debt and infrastructure that uh, that more developed economies have, especially those in the financial services sector. So, you know, in a previous life, I spent a reasonable amount of time in parts of Africa on payments projects. And you know, in a lot of developed economies, you've got seven or eight other actors that are involved in some kind of payments transaction, which makes it really complicated and expensive. However, when you go to somewhere like Kenya, who rolled out you know a service years ago for mobile money called Mpesa. They had an opportunity to really use technology in a different way because they weren't settled with a whole bunch of, of legacy, legacy debt that they actually had to deal with. And so that's why I, I, I do think that a lot of innovation is able to be um, kind of propagated and move faster in some of those developing economies and emerging economies because they don't, and they're not settled with that infrastructure they have to deal with. And I guess just building on one of CJ's points, I guess you might not want to hear about the challenges that a growing technology company has, but honestly one of the biggest challenges we see in our customer base which is life insurance carriers is the cultural mindset shift around the use of data primarily uh, and, and, and really being able to actually innovate and think about the, the customer as opposed to thinking about profitability first. So when I think about some of the users that we primarily deal with, a lot of time they're working what I would say in the business. They're doing spending a lot of their time on building models, trying to understand data, access data, whereas we have a belief that in order to really help insurers grow provide the right product at the right price at the right time to customers, we need to have those people working on the business. And so that means, you know, when, when we talk about automa automation or digitalization or trying to improve workflows, it's not about trying to automate people's roles, it's really trying to move them into more of a position where they're focusing on how can I provide more value to our customers and by consequence how can I provide more value back into our organization. And so for us, when we work with a customer uh, for the first time, that um, kind of cultural relationship for us is really important. If they're not interested in making a significant step change in the way that they do business and the way that they operate, they're probably gonna, not going to be a good fit because there's going to be a lot of people within that organisation that are going to rail against doing something differently. So for us especially, you know, we tend to work you know, more in some of the developed, developed countries where they are kind of saddled with a lot of you know, legacy infrastructure and debt and... 35 core systems through a lot of mergers and acquisitions that they've had to make and there's a whole bunch of kind of disparate you know systems that aren't connected to each other it's it's really how do we how do we take them on that journey where they believe working on the business rather than in the business is actually going to help them grow help attract more customers and help attract more customers at, at the right price with the right product so you know i could talk all day about all the challenges that lie in, in data but i actually for, for me like one of the biggest things i see in the industry is really that that cultural challenge yeah, that's a very good point, Jeff. Actually, just a follow-up question, because you actually mentioned about uh, automation is not meant to replacing people, right? So what's your view on the future actual profession? Because I believe we do have uh, actuaries in the audience, and uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, we're a company that whose primary users are our actuaries, right? And so within our own business, you know, we're, we're, we're split from an expertise point of view between, you know, software engineers, you know, data scientists, and actuaries. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, kind of ask us about what's the future role of the actuary, what's the future role of the actuarial profession, are they being, you know, somewhat sidelined by the growth of data science? Um, you know, I, I think like any role or profession, they're not immune to change. Actuaries are absolutely one of those, and I actually think when you look at the skills that an insurance company have, there's no one that understands the business better than what actuaries do. Like, their fundamental job is to, is to understand and price risk for an insurance company, right? And so they have got a unique set of skills that's, that's credentialed, that's qualified, and has a huge amount of knowledge. The key is, how do you harness that knowledge? And, and going back to my earlier, earlier point, and actually get them focusing on how can you start to provide different economic value and really focusing outwards 
you know, an actuary's job often is to focus very inwards. So how do you get them focusing more outwards? How do you give them opportunities to look at different models that are being supplied by data science team to understand customer behavior and really get them to figure out where is, where is more value that they can extract um, for their organization? But again, that kind of comes down to as well, the organization also has to start thinking outside in as opposed to inside out because the way that products are often designed by insurance companies is we want to make money from this product first, then we're going to sell it and see how many people buy it, not what is the kind of product that people want to buy and how do we design that appropriately. Can I, I just want to inject uh, a little bit of a funny clip here. So, yeah, so our team, we actually have our own actuary team as well. Uh, I remembered how I managed to uh, recruit our first actuary into our tiny startup company like three years ago. Uh, so at that time, you know, we were very small, and uh, so I was I was referred to this uh, really uh, very uh, very bright young man, um, so who work at uh, one of the largest insurance companies uh, in the world, um, and he's got a like, PhD in mathematics um, from NTU. He's got an IQ of 172. Really, very smart guy. So and you know, so I'm like, so I asked him. I said, well. Tell me, you're smart. You're working at you know a huge company. Must be very fun to you know work as an actuary. Uh, what's your primary tool? He said, Well, basically my primary tool is Excel. I said, You must be kidding me, right? So, you know, you're a math genius. Uh, you, you got like massive amount of data. You, you must be having great fun playing with it. He said, No, we, we, we you know our 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 like core system is. Uh, very legacy, and we don't get to touch the database ourselves, right? It's gonna be somebody who is gonna compile some kind of aggregator, maybe aggregated data, maybe a few hundred rows, maximum a few thousand rows, and they play with it on Excel. Well, I said, well, guess what? I cannot pay you the salary that you that you get at your big company, um, but if you come to to, to our company, um, then. You you're not gonna be working with Excel. So you're gonna be you know writing your Python scripts. You're gonna be dealing with machine learnings. You're gonna be working with the you know the the, the, the Google um, you know machine learning tools and you know play with all those interesting stuff. And um, what do you think? And he did. He joined. And um, I think his life is more exciting now. So I would say if we think about the future of actuary, it's gonna be a wonderful mixture. Of uh, you know traditional actuary model and a lot more about uh, you know data science and computer science. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just to I think add to that, I completely agree with that. Right. So I think my view is uh, AI will not eliminate the I think actuarial or any other I think uh, processing or operational processes within an insurance company, but they're going to eliminate a significant chunk of them. And the reason for that, I fundamentally believe, is if you look at just actuarial uh, work, it's science. It's not art. Right? So when it is science, uh, frankly, a computer can do science better than anybody else can. So uh, uh, I, I think uh, today it does not happen because uh, when was the last time an actual model or an algorithm or an actual model was really updated? Right? Maybe three, 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, right? So, uh, and there's a reason for that, right? And, uh, and because that has never kind of moved, I fundamentally believe that it's going to move into a system where companies who are using AI in a very different context are going to come in and be able to not only structure policies better, but maybe be able to price it fundamentally differently and are generally going to basically grow very, very fast. I just look at what Oscar Health did uh, in the US. There's a reason why Oscar Health is valued at $6.5 billion. When was the last time we heard of an insurance company being valued at $6.5 billion, right? With 250,000 users, right? So uh, I, I think there's a reason for that. And, and the reason is they're actually using tech in a very different way to try and do what was being done in a legacy system. And I genuinely believe that's where the world is going to head, right? So, and this has to happen. Otherwise, uh, we're doing users a disservice, right? To your point, you know, nobody kind of thinks about what the user really wants and kind of go from there. They really think about, okay, this is what I want in my system today, and then let's see how we can go out and kind of sell that. Uh, I think that's going to be the challenge. And hopefully AI will disrupt a lot of this stuff going forward. Did you ask us that question because you're an actuary? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys are doing a lot of uh, you know, innovative stuff. Oh, we're stuff different. That, right? We're just growing stuff on <laughs> different, yeah. So, we, wouldn't, um, we wouldn't be on one of your panels again if we didn't <laughs> say that actuaries are awesome. Yeah, let me have a second thought on that. Okay. Um, so great, uh, great comments. Uh, actually, you guys all mentioned about Python, machine learning, like all the big data trendy words, right? And then we heard about data lake, data mart. Uh, I actually Googled last night. I even saw this uh, 
data graveyard when uh, people just dump, keep dumping all the data in and try to, hopefully they can do something down the road, but uh, actually uh, at, the, at the end of the day, they don't even remember what's in the, in the system. So just a follow-up question on that. So what's your view on um, any data related or data process that's as actually been overhyped or anything that haven't been thought through enough, so not been discussed enough? What's your view on that? So uh, I, I think if I could just give a, a quick anecdote without naming this insurance company, a very big insurance company in the US. So we started working with them on the pediatric side and they said, hey, you know, uh, the reason we want to do this is uh, they actually had a big data graveyard on pediatrics. So they were like, uh, uh, you know, hey, how, how many users do you need to basically do some testing? We were trying to customize a solution for them. We said, look, so statistically, roughly about 1,300 users is what is required. right? They said, oh, we have, <laughs> we can just give you like one set just tomorrow, which has basically 10,000 users. We don't know what to do with it, right? And they had just been sitting on this data for, I don't know, ages. And they had never used this data. And they had their customer base of data that they were lying in the pediatric side, which they had done nothing with, was over 250,000 users in the pediatric side. And they were just kind of clueless as to what to do about it. So where we sometimes struggle to get data sets which are 1,500, 2,500, 3,000, they were sitting on 250,000 data sets just doing, you know, uh, whatever, getting co cobwebs or, or whatever it is, right? So um, I, I think uh, what we are essentially seeing is, again, kind of going back to the fact that a lot of insurance companies kind of jumped onto this data bandwagon without really fully understanding what it needed. Uh, whether what they needed from a system perspective, what they needed to change from a people perspective, uh, what they needed to change from a technology perspective. Right? Just to give you one more anecdote, we work with an Asian insurance company, we were part of their incubator, et cetera, and stuff like that. Their head of sales, uh, so I basically asked them, how many users do you have, families between 30 years of age to 40 years of age with two kids in the system? They didn't know. They didn't even know how many of those uh, users actually had emails which were logged in the system. Right? So technology perspective, all of this stuff needs to change. And I think people have just kind of jumped onto this great big data AI kind of bandwagon without realizing the system is not there. And so I think that is going to be a big challenge. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. But I also think as well, like we talk about, you know, data lakes, I think pediatrics and data graveyard is terrible words to hear in the same sentence. But anyway, um, but I think I, I do. I think the problem with insurance companies, you know, building data lakes or trying to aggregate all their data or connect systems together, is they're not really defining the use cases that are going to help them in their business. So I think the the ideal way to to use the data is to define what is it you're actually trying to achieve, and that could be something different in underwriting versus claims versus product versus distribution. If you understand the genuine challenges that you have in your business around growth or margin improvement or retaining customers or, or whatever the challenge actually is, how do you actually define a use case and a solution to that problem of which data is a part of that process? Data isn't the only answer. It's certainly going to be a, a huge part of it. But you know, just shipping someone 100,000 pieces of data and say, figure out how we can get some insights from this is not a particularly ideal process. I think the key comes is when you can really identify the business challenges that you have the use cases that support that and what data actually goes into that process and how you make that systemic. I think for me that's you know, one of the things that I, you know, when I go and talk to some of our customers and they, they talk about you know, data lakes or, or whatever else it might be, my first question is what are you doing with it? What, what, tell me the five use cases that you've got that you're going to use that data for. And often they'll go, well, you know, we, we want to understand customer behavior. Okay, what does that mean? And they can't really tell you. Not everyone's like that. I don't want to you know, cast aspersions over the entire in insurance industry. There's lots that actually do understand what they want to do with it. But I do see that as a, as a big challenge. Where you want to chime in? And well, all I know is that I'm terrible at it with names, so I wouldn't remember too many of those uh, fancy terms that comes along. Um, but I think, you know, those, I think the whole AI industry right now is overhyped. Okay? I'm sorry. I'm also in that. But... Um, but I think overall it, it, it's quite hyped. Uh, we really need to go find the real use cases, and um, and and sometimes the real use cases can be small, right? It doesn't have to be actually be, be big. Um, so Facebook got a massive amount of data, but I think where, for example, it's 
the, some real use cases is like facial recognition. Uh, when you have enough data, you can be able to recognize, help people tag, tag photos. It might not be, it might be super like, you know, how do I say, um, uh, solve the world problems, but it solved the real problem for Facebook. Um, so for, for insurance, you know, where we might find the real good use of data and, and AI might also be on some of the smaller scale things. Uh, we'll start from there. Okay, great. So um, we are pretty much running out of time. So I just want to uh, take one question from the audience and maybe I just get a really short answer from all of you. So uh, someone asked, can data be used to improve the insurance from a customer point of view? So uh, I'll start with Wei. Yeah, I think so. I think you know one of the things here was uh, where with data and, and machine learning can really help is to make insurance more transparent and more fair. Um, because a lot of times, especially I think you know in Southeast Asia or more developing countries, there's a there's a big gap uh, uh, of trust uh, between consumers and the insurance companies. Uh, and I think uh, this is one of the areas where uh, data can really help uh, bridge that gap, makes it more more transparent. I, I think data is useful for uh, anybody to tell consumers what, why, and what they need to do. Because you know, consumers really, when when they're looking at kind of absolute kind of data, they can't really kind of process that, right? So most users, consumers want to know what is the aha, what is the so what of that insight. They want to be told what they need to do as a consequence of that. So I fundamentally think that when you add this layer of insights on top. That's where the use of data will be, is to basically almost kind of guide the consumer into what they should be doing next and how they should be thinking about potential problems that they're kind of facing and how a potential solution is going to solve that. That is basically where I think data really kind of plays a role rather than data in and as of itself. I think the customer point of view is, is absolutely got to be front and center of, of anything. So for me, when I think about how data can improve it, it should be you know, right product, right price, right place, right time. And data can play a huge part of that. I mean, you know, so many people today, especially in lots of countries, are forcing people to still go into a, you know, an office that's on the outskirts of town to talk to a, a life insurance advisor in the in the U.S. whose average age, their demographic is a 59-year-old white male, and they're trying to sell to, you know, millennials who don't want to go to, you know, some office outside of town to buy life insurance from someone that they don't know and have no, you know, real relationship or engagement with. They have more engagement with their phone or the digital device than they do with, with this person. So I think you know, really being able to offer products at the right place at the right place at the right time is, is really important. <laughs>